Alright, so on today's video we're going to do a product review on this brand new Atherin Genesis MP15 NHO scale. Now, Atherin has released uh, this model in the past before, but this model has come uh, with some updated tooling options that allows for some front and rear ditch lights out of the box. We're going to take an up close look at that here in just a minute, and then later we're going to add ESU sound and maybe do some weathering and some graffiti work on this model. Hi friends, I'm Steven and this is my channel, Signal Up Productions, where I make videos all about trains. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and while you're at it, click that bell icon so you're notified every time I post a new video. Now let's take a close look at this model. Alright, so we're going to do the typical unboxing Atherin Genesis box. Uh, pretty typical. Uh, very heavy cardboard, so it should protect it in transit. Always get some different kind of paperwork to come with it. You get a uh, operator's manual. I mean, it's a pretty typical HO scale locomotive, so I'm not sure how much it's going to tell us considering it's a, a DC only model. It's not a tsunami sound, so. We don't even have to uh, uh, look at the instructions on how to operate the sound on the locomotive because there is none. Um, but it does give you some pointers on um, how proper maintenance, uh, lubrication points there on the, uh, the, the diagram inside the operator's manual. So I'm not going to use that for today. There's also, this is kind of handy uh, for later whenever we go to install sound in this locomotive. We've got an exploited diagram here and then a parts list on the back that shows all of the different parts that are uh, possibly used on this model. Uh, this is common on almost every Atherin item that I buy is uh, don't forget to sign up for Atherin News. And uh, warranty information here uh, gives you uh, details on Atherin's uh, warranty for the model. So uh, foam sheet typical Atherin Genesis plastic clamshell. So the model slides out of the sleeve. They like to pack these well so that they can make the 10,000 mile journey from China to here. A couple of uh, styrofoam inserts. Uh, once the model is at your house, you really don't need those styrofoam inserts in the box. They're not going to protect it. That's really meant to protect it uh, from heavy uh, shifting while in transit in these uh, ocean going containers. But once it's inside your um, your box or your tote or whatever it is that you use to transport your models to uh, like the club layout or something like that, um, that's really unnecessary from that point. So that uh, that cam shell just pops open. Um, if you've ever bought it, Atherin Genesis locomotive before, it's identical to all the other locomotives that they have. Uh, that part top pops out. Uh, unfold the top. Here we have a plastic cover over the top of the locomotive. So. These Genesis locomotives are highly detailed, which means uh, a lot of this detail is very fragile. Um, what we'll want to do is pick it up by the long hood. Uh, the shell is screwed on, so we don't have to worry about that. We shouldn't have to worry about that popping off. Uh, we can grab it by the shell. The plastic sometimes comes with it. That lets us set it out and get the uh, packaging out of the way here. Uh, then it also includes these uh, inserts, these foam pads uh, in between the hood and the uh, handrails. Had a blank moment there. There's one on each side, so we'll take those out. That protects the handrails. You will want to keep those if you uh, intend to repack the locomotive and take it to uh, different locations to operate that, that model. You'll want to keep those and put those back in there because the uh, you know, the metal handrails, they're not coming back. Uh, what they're in now is these plastic handrails. And they are kind of flimsy, kind of delicate. If you want a highly uh, detailed locomotive uh, with quality um, accuracy, 
I mean, that's just what we're going to have to live with. And first glance of the model, um, pretty typical uh, Genesis level detail. Uh, some brake piping. Oh, I can, yep. I stuck my finger on the bottom of the truck, and we'll get a close-up look there. You should, yeah, you can see that, that wet there. That's excess amount of lubricant oozing out the bottom of the, uh, the truck. So I'm going to have to not only wipe that up, but I probably will have to disassemble the trucks and uh, wipe out a lot of the excess lubricant that's inside there so it's not spewing out uh, as I'm using the model. Uh, you can look up photographs on the internet of these models. Uh, Railroad Picture Archives is a good site that uh, has a large collection of prototype photos of almost every locomotive that has ever been used in the, in the U.S. And I did find a prototype photo from about 12, 13 years ago of this exact model. And so far I'm seeing that the horn is... So the, uh, you know, the horn doesn't appear to be exactly accurate to that. Also, I'll note that, uh, and I'm sure this was a compromise on Atherin's part. Uh, if we look here, we can see the front ditch lights uh, are on the pilot right there underneath the uh, anti-climber. And the prototype photos that I seen, they were actually mounted to the anti-climber. So uh, just little bits like that. Uh, the bell does appear to be in the correct location. You can see uh, right here. We've got the bell down here right next to the, uh, the step well. Uh, everything else I'm seeing is, is pretty nice and mostly accurate. So we're going to um, put this on the test track now and see uh, see how it operates just with in DC mode. With the engine on the turntable, we can get a 360 degree view of the model. This model is equipped with windshield wipers, MU hoses, uncoupling levers, spare knuckles, fuel tank details, horn, firecracker antenna, bell, a cab sunshade on the conductor's side, and an all-weather window on the engineer's side, among other details. Similar to their big brother, the GP-15, the MP-15 also includes a see-through grill underneath the radiator. Alright, so another thing we're going to check is we're going to check the uh, wheel gauge from the factory using our NMRA standards gauge here. I'm going to flip the model over and uh, check each wheel the best I can with my, with my wheel gauge here. All four axles uh, do have the wheels in their proper gauge. Next up, we're going to put the model on our uh, test track here and check the coupler height from the factory. Now, I will say these models come with the plastic McHenry couplers. Uh, I'll be switching those out later for some KD um, number 158 scale head metal couplers. But uh, we'll just check these couplers from the factory and the trip pin is just a little low not by much the coupler face is acceptable but the trip pin was just a hair low and same on that side that one's just a just a touch just a touch low not enough that I don't think it will hang up on anything as long as you're uh, track is uh, flat, but I mean if you do have some uh, grade transitions between uh, flat and incline, I would say you know if there's something in between the rails at that transition point it may 
it may actually catch on something. So you might want to check yours to make sure they uh, are where they're supposed to be. And uh, now we're going to hook up the test track and we're going to just uh, run it uh, with uh, no decoder in it and uh, make sure it runs properly. Uh, then we're going to get started installing the DCC decoder. All right, with no decoder installed, this engine does have the jumper on the motherboard inside the shell uh, to allow it for DC operation out of the box. And as we can see here, uh, the locomotive runs uh, very nice and smooth and quiet in DC mode. Uh, I mean, I can really control the, uh, the speed with my MRC power, uh, power pack here to get a very nice slow creep with this model. In DC, the headlights do appear to be directional. They only come on uh, in, the, in the one direction, the direction of, of travel. And if we look straight on to the locomotive, coming towards us. Uh, the headlights are not very bright uh, with just a small amount of throttle here. Um, I mean the, the headlight brightness is going to be consistent with the speed of the locomotive since there's more power coming to the rails uh, to brighten that up. But if I hold it in place here, you can see the, the more juice we give it, uh, the brighter the headlights are going to be. The headlights are visible but I did notice that uh, you have to be looking pretty well straight on them to really see their full intensity. To get the shell off, flip the model upside down and rest it on a foam cradle. The shell is only held on by two small screws holding the coupler pockets in place. Remove both screws, slide out the coupler pockets, then gently rock the shell while pulling up. All right, so it appears that uh, the uh, track pickups come up from underneath the frame uh, to the ends of the motherboard. Uh, this also is where the headlights and ditch light LEDs are connected. Uh, so there's separate LEDs for each uh, front and rear uh, ditch light. That way, if you wanted to make ditch lights flash, it's just a matter of uh, unwiring them from their current connectors on the motherboard and um, connecting them to a different function output on on this motherboard. There are um, looks like they are already wired possibly. Let me get my get the tape off here. It's possible they may already be set up for um, you know, if you wanted to make them flash. Of course, Union Pacific did not have their ditch lights flash, uh, at least not on these models of locomotives. Um, I say that they did not have flashing ditch lights. Uh, there are a few exceptions, a couple of uh, Southern Pacific locomotives that are still floating around. Southern Pacific on several of their locomotives did have flashing ditch lights. And uh, the UP maintenance shops, even though the locomotives have gone in for repaint, uh, they never did remove the flashing module for those ditch lights. So they still, they still have flashing ditch lights for, held over from uh, the Southern Pacific days, uh, which is pretty amazing. I'd say the shops are doing that just because they thought it was funny to, to, to do that. Let's see here. So these wires are kind of a rat's nest. They're not as neat and orderly as uh, my other Genesis locomotives typically are. Uh, they're just kind of all tangled up here. So um, like that, that wire is like wrapped around something else underneath that I uh, can't uh, even do anything with. So let's see if we look at the ditch lights, those headlights. I'll go there. Okay. Yeah, okay. So it looks like the um, 
the front headlights and front ditch lights go to these pads right here. So the front headlight goes to uh, the normal headlight output. Uh, each ditch light here goes to, um, looks like uh, F, F7 and F8 on the uh, motherboard. And then the uh, rear headlight goes to the rear headlight pad back here on the back of the motherboard. The red is the common, so all the reds go to the same commons on the front and the back there to make things easy. Uh, looks like they go to, the ditch lights here go to pads F4 and F5. So pad F6 is unused. So you theoretically could add, say, a couple more LEDs and have uh, ground lights underneath the cab or something like that. I'm not going to do anything like that, but uh, there they are. And because I'm going to be adding sound to this model, um, I'm going to be installing a sugar cube speaker, the single speaker, and attaching the speaker wires to the motherboard right here. That way, in the event that I need to remove the uh, decoder, um, I don't have to take out the speaker to go with it. Now, this is the DC jumper that makes the model function on DC out of the box, and also provides for, apparently, the um, directional headlights uh, that allow that to work there. Uh, so I'm just using this uh, curved nose um, tweezers and just gently prying this up. Uh, I could try and use uh, just my fingers and um, do it that way, but I would be afraid that I'd put too much uh, effort into that and it'd pop off so quick and then I'd end up um, breaking something, so I just use that to just gently pry that up so I don't twist. You definitely don't want to break off any of the 21 pin pins there. So that is our jumper. I don't need the jumper because I'm not going back to DC anytime soon. Too heavily invested in this DCC stuff. Uh, this is a weight that is in place of where the speaker would go if you were to get the uh, sound equipped model from the factory. So I'm going to have to take that weight off uh, to allow me to install the, uh, the ESU uh, sugar cube speaker to go in that spot there. But what I am going to do is use the weight as a guide uh, when building my baffle for the, uh, the look sound speaker uh, to know how big of a baffle I'm going to make uh, with what is included in the uh, speaker kit. Okay, so the weight just comes off with a couple of Phillips head screws. We don't want to lose these screws because more than likely I will be able to use them to um, reattach the uh, speaker enclosure. Okay. My magnet doesn't want to get that one off there. Got to be really careful with all this tiny little stuff here. That allows the weight to slide off the pins here. But, in their genius, the truck pickups. Oh, wait a second. The truck pickups go through the weight, which means <laughs> I have to remove the truck pickup wires from the motherboard in order to get this weight off of the model. And in my experience, I've never had luck reattaching the any of the, the wires to the motherboard using the Athern plastic clips. Um, I know a lot of people will pull those clips off and then solder the wires directly to that. In this case, I'm going to have to do that with the, uh, the truck pickups there. But... Um, I'm only going to do that on the one. I'm not going to uh, solder on all of these. Uh, I'm just going to hope that they don't ever give me trouble. And if they do, I guess I will cross that bridge then. So I'm going to have to get my pliers here. And 
see if I can gently get those uh, off there. There's one. And there's two. I don't need those. I can throw those away. Now I can uh, pull the pickup wires off there. And remove that. So I'm going to hold on to that for just a minute. And uh, I said earlier that I could uh, install maybe some ground lights under the cab, but uh, I guess I didn't read the box very carefully. This model has ground lights underneath the cab already installed. They're on one of these uh, function pads here, so that's pretty exciting. I look forward to photographing this model at night. You'll want to keep uh, in mind which wire goes to the uh, engineer side and the conductor side of the of the model because you'll have to make sure you put that back on the uh, motherboard in the correct orientation otherwise you'll have a dead short when you try and run this this model on uh, on the layout all right so ESU speakers come in this little uh, poly bag here like this and a, a sleeve uh, the sprue is going to have a lot of different options for how you uh, mount the speaker in your in your locomotive if you need a round speaker, a uh, larger round or smaller round, or the, uh, the rectangular speaker bit there. Uh, the speaker comes pre-attached to a, um, a little thin plastic clip there on the side to, that lets you know which side goes into the, the baffle. You will have to solder the decoder wire, so you'll have some pretty small wire that's uh, made by ESU there. You'll have to solder that to the um, tabs, the metal tabs on the back of the speaker. And those are very small metal tabs, um, very small wire. So if your soldering skills are not all that great, you may, you may want to look at buying a sugar cube speaker that's already got the wires attached or ask a friend if you know a friend that uh, is good at soldering very small stuff there. And so I'm going to start clipping out the rectangular uh, baffle holder there, the speaker holder. I've uh, got the, the end of the baffle already cut out. So I'm using my screw cutters here to um, cut the, uh, the baffle loose from the screw. Uh, this is going to be the part that the speaker actually clips to. It's got the receiving hole there for the, the speaker to clip into. I'm going to glue this together with some tacky glue uh, that I find uh, fills in all the gaps in the imperfections uh, between all of the different baffle pieces. If I just put the, the lid on the speaker holder, uh, I'm going to have a pretty small, pretty thin baffle, you can see right there. What I've learned in, and I'm no expert when it comes to sound decoders uh, or speakers or any of that uh, stuff, so if you've got suggestions or uh, comments, criticism that you want to add, go ahead and leave those in the comments down below. Uh, but I've been, I've read that you want to have as much air in your baffle as possible. Uh, so you want a, a thick baffle. The ESU sprue does come with several different um, thicknesses of uh, to insert between the, the cap and the speaker holder, so that you can change the uh, thickness of your sugar cube speaker to meet the uh, what you have. On your model to uh, what you got to work with there and since I know how big of a speaker I can fit because I'm going to replace the weight that we pulled out of the, the under the hood there I'm just going to match the thickness of my baffle to the thickness of that weight so I can know that I'm going to fit under the under the hood there I also know that I'm not going to need these extra uh, screw tab screw holes here so I'm going to cut those off uh, because those are just going to get in the way These are not all the same thickness either, so you can uh, you can find the one that's the thickness that you need here. There we go. 
so that made my baffle a little bit thicker. Okay, every little bit helps. I'll take all I, I can get. And I can see now that um, it's about the same thickness as the weight that I pulled out. And if I match it up on this side, it's uh, the same thickness as the, uh, as the weight. And it's definitely shorter than the weight, so I know it's going to fit under the weight. So I'm going to glue that together, and while that's setting up, uh, I'm going to go ahead and solder the wires on to uh, my speaker. Alright, so before I go too much further in my decoder installation process here, uh, I'm going to get the decoder out of the package. This is a 21 pin decoder, and it'll fit right on that motherboard, but I'm going to uh, install it on my ESU test board here, and it's got the uh, 21 pin uh, spot right here, and so I can plug that decoder in here and test all of its functions before I actually in install it into the locomotive. Uh, just so I know that uh, right out of the box, that's a good decoder. Then, if I install it in the locomotive and something's uh, going on with it, it's not working right, then I can trace it not to the decoder, but maybe something on the motherboard, or uh, maybe there's a wire touching that I, I didn't see. So, I'm going to hook up the test board to my loc programmer. I'm going to download the sound file for an MP15 locomotive into the decoder. So that's something I'm going to mention about ESU decoders. When you buy these from your hobby shop or from ESU directly or someplace on the internet, uh, you have to specifically ask for a sound file to be downloaded to it. If you don't do that, it's going to come with generic sound. I hope you can see that on the video there. Uh, all of the decoders come with a generic sound file from the factory and you have to specifically request your dealer to download that sound file of your choosing to the decoder that you're buying before they ship it to you. Uh, if they ship it to you and you didn't request that, then you're going to have a generic sound file in there, which I can tell you does not sound very good. I'm not even going to show it on this video. You'll at that point either need to send it to a dealer to have it programmed with your sound, choice, uh, your sound file or you're going to have to buy a local programmer to download the sound file directly to the decoder on your own. Now, if you do a lot with ESU, I highly recommend buying both the local programmer and the test board. Uh, the test board does not, is not exclusive to just ESU products. Uh, it's basically a locomotive on a uh, PC board with a motor, a different headlight, uh, and a speaker built in so you can test all of your uh, decoders and all your different uh, connection formats, 8-pin, the, I think that's a 6-pin, uh, just a hardwire decoder, 21-pin, or the, uh, the micro, uh, or micro decoders there. So back to the uh, programming uh, ESU. I'm not going to go into that in this video. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, download the sound file for the MP15 and uh, program it to my liking, and then I'll test it on the test board. Once I know that it's working, then we'll plug it in and check my speaker that we've installed in the locomotive. When installing a 21 pin decoder to the motherboard, make sure to line up the pins properly. The socket on the decoder faces up and there is a missing pin on the plug on the motherboard that should correspond to a blank spot on the socket that's on the decoder. Now that everything under the shell is finished, I can reinstall the coupler boxes. I'm replacing the stock plastic couplers for some real KD metal couplers I'm using number 158 scale head couplers. Guess I don't need the old ones anymore. Alright, so now that I've got the decoder and speaker successfully installed into the locomotive, I've tested it and then made sure that everything uh, sounds and operates like it's supposed to on there. Minor, some, uh, some minor programming adjustments I need to make. I'm going to go ahead and start doing a uh, weathering uh, update on this locomotive. It's a fairly old locomotive on the system. I model modern day Union Pacific, so this locomotive would have been around for a long time. In fact, I do believe uh, today uh, this locomotive has probably been sold off to a, a scrap or a lease co company. I don't even think Union Pacific uses MP15s anymore to my understanding. So to start, I'm going to pull off the uh, handrails on the long hood. Uh, and that way, whenever I'm airbrushing some of the and using some powder chalks uh, to weather the side of the long hood, uh, those aren't getting in the way or getting damaged. So I'm going to take those off. The other thing I'm going to do is 
Let me find it. Right here. I've got some reflective, actually reflective, you can see right there, and uh, yellow safety stripes. I'm going to update my model to be uh, more consistent with today's locomotives. Um, in my world, we'll just say that Union Pacific is still using these today. Uh, so I'm going to add the yellow frame stripe around um, the, the the locomotive side sill there. So we're going to do that with these uh, neat little reflective stripes made by uh, Smokebox Graphics. If you have never looked those up or used them before, you should check those out. So I'm going to pull off the uh, handrails on the long hood gently. Uh, we're going to add the yellow frame stripe. We're going to do some weathering and maybe even a little bit of graffiti on the uh, on the long hood there. Well, that alone makes a huge improvement to this model, bringing it up to today's uh, standard of what we normally see on locomotives out on the Union Pacific with the yellow uh, side sill frame strike. Let's everybody know that this model is a modern model of the, uh, the locomotive. So now with that done, I'm going to go ahead and um, break out the airbrush and do a little bit of uh, weathering. Before I start any painting, or use any kind of clear coat, I cover the windows with masking tape. Clear coat will frost the windows. I cut the masking tape in small bits and cover just the window glazing. I first put on a light coat of gloss. This will help hide the decal film. The graffiti is a mix of Blair line and micro scale. Cut out the decal and soak it in clean water according to the directions. Slide the decal into place and brush on some Microsol setting solution. This will help the decal settle over the contours of the shell. Once dry, spray a light coat of dull coat to seal the decals. Be sure to use gloss and dull coat in a well ventilated area. For airbrushing, I use a single action pache and set the air compressor to about 20 psi. I use Badger Monoflex water based acrylic paint because it's airbrush ready and cleans up easily with water. Here, I'm using some engine black as well as some rail brown and sand color paint. Refer to prototype photos to help guide your weathering. After the paint has dried, I use a couple of different colors of pastel chalks to highlight a few different areas around the model. Lastly, I seal everything with a final layer of dull coat and this engine is ready to go to work.